want to give, I always like to say hi to the podcast listeners who are listening in this service, but especially this week, because so many of you are out and about on spring break and you're going to catch the sermon midweek. We, we miss you and we look forward to seeing you back next week. As we're starting today, we're going into the Easter ser- series and Easter um, as we're approaching up. Uh, I want to remind you two weeks from today is Easter. Did y'all realize that? And some of you are sitting there going, uh-oh, I got to prepare a meal. But let's forget that for now, okay? And just sit there and think about this. Um, who can you invite to Easter? Who can you invite? There's, there's several ways we're going to encourage you to invite someone to Easter. One is through these cards, which are around the building. And we encourage you to drop these off as you go through a drive through or something along those lines and place them in appropriate places, not inappropriate places, whatever that means. I don't know, but I've learned to say it, okay? Um, so you place them in appropriate places and invite people to come. Another thing that we're going to do is next Sunday night when we have the groundbreaking at 5 p.m., hope you'll come to that. Hear the mayor's coming. Hear something about pulled pork. Not sure, but I hope you come for that. Um, during that time, for those that want to, we're going to have glass chalk to decorate your car. And so you can say, come to Easter at Harrison, and we'll let you do that. Here's the key to that. Leave it up for a week and then take it off because we don't want advertising Easter at Harrison come May. And also, the longer it's on there, the harder it is to get off. So obviously, we're not going to guilt anyone to doing that. But if you want to do that, we'd love to have you do that. Just don't cut people off and yell at people if you're advertising for a Calvary at Easter. Okay, so that's another way to advertise. The third way I would encourage you to advertise someone is by personal invitation. The banners that we have out front, these signs and, and everything else we do, they're actually supplemental. And what we're hoping is that people get several invitations through the car. They say, oh, Easter at Harrison. And then, then you come follow that up and go, hey, we'd like to invite you to come to our church, to Easter at Harrison. Everything else is trying to get people who are naturally geared to go to church anyways, to come to, come to join us. But the one, that, the one that will gear people to come to church that weren't going to come to church is a personal invitation. So we'd encourage you to do that. Finally, around our stage, there's these door hangers. And we have a a group of college students this week. There's 2,000 of them that are going to be distributing these, um, placing them on doors. And we don't do this very often, but this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to pray for the door hangers. Not the door hangers, but the people they represent. And so as we're doing this, if you feel comfortable, and if you don't, please stay seated. But if you feel comfortable to come pray over the houses that these represent, would you come on up and just pray over these? There's a winding creek and university farms. and You can come on now. Anybody want to come? No one's coming. Okay, it's a couple of people. Yeah, come on. Come on up. And then just pray over these and then ask for God to, to bless these um, as they go forward. God, we're thankful for all that you're doing through the lives of this church. And God, right now, even these door hangers that are here, we know they represent families. We know they represent people. We know they represent lives that need to be changed by the power of you. So God, would you help them to come at just the right time and them to not just be thrown away casually, but God, may we hear great stories about how you're using these to change people's lives as they are drawn to you. We ask these things in the power of your name. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. Um, Last night, I was practicing something that we started in the the series uh, called The Frost, and I, I was practicing this idea of confession. By the way, you do know that when we do something, we don't want you just, we teach you something, we don't want you to to practice it for like three weeks, but we hope it's longer than that. And so I was practicing confession last night, and this is the point where I qualify, in the world's eyes, these weren't horrible sins. But as I was sitting there confessing, and God kept showing me more and more sins that I needed to confess, my list seemed long. And, And I remember sitting there going last night going, oh God, this list seems long. I'm such a failure. And I felt kind of bad about myself. I don't know if you've ever been there where you're kind of struggling with your faith and you're struggling feeling like, oh, I messed up way more than I thought I did. And, and then I just kept hearing in my head these words repeated to me, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of Christ in me. You see, this series, Romans, to know our salvation is all about this. It's not about us coming and saying we've arrived and we've finished. It it is coming to the place where we understand that it is the power of what Jesus has done. The song we just sang, the power that is alive, the same power that raised him from the grave is alive in us. It is alive in us for those who are followers of Christ. And this changes us. And as a follower of Christ, as Trevor talked about a few weeks ago, our obligation is to make sure that our life is lived in act of worship. Because see, you're worshiping something. 
And what you're worshiping is simply what you put your worth into. What, if it's worth it, you are worshiping it. If it's your job, then you are worshiping it. If it where you're putting your worth is what you're worshiping. And as a follower of Christ, my biggest, um, my biggest plea is that you would realize that what we need to worship is Jesus Christ. That we focus and we put our hearts affection and our mind's attention on what it means to be a follower of Christ. Why? Because we are not ashamed of the gospel because of its work in us. And last week we, we talked about this as we go forward and well, let's just go ahead and dive into this week's lessons. Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, verses one through four, as we're unpacking this idea of salvation and what it means to us. Romans chapter eight, verses one through four, there should be a Bible around you. If you don't own one, we'd encourage you to take that home as our gift from us to you. Also, don't forget, the Bible app's free on, uh, I, on, through iTunes, so you can download that too. Romans chapter eight, verses one through four says this. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus, those who are followers of Christ Jesus, because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. What the law could not do since it was limited by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the flesh like ours under sin's domain as a, and as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You were set free. Now I realize this passage has a lot of churchy words. And if you haven't grown up in the church, that can be like, what's it saying? Here's the point. It, the, Christ has come to set you free. There's no condemnation. There is no judgment. He has come to set you free. See, you and I, as we talked about last week, we're made to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We were made to experience grace and peace. The problem is, God gave us a standard of laws that were meant to protect us, to, to keep us in right relationship. And somewhere along the lines, we violated those laws. We broke God's relation to his best interest for our lives. In doing so, we deserved eternal separation from him. Justice had to be paid. And as we talked about last week, God sent, the father sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And so as we were standing in the courtroom in the defendant's chair, we were guilty and our defense attorney not only fought for us, but advocated for us. And when we were still found guilty, he took our place and paid the price of our sentence upon his shoulders as he died on the cross. And as a result, the law has been broken what the law deserved, the justice has been justified by someone who paid the price. And therefore there is no condemnation for those who are following Christ Jesus. This is exciting. This is exhilarating. This is beyond enthusiasm. But here's what I want to ask today. You were the person who was sitting in that chair. You were in the courtroom. You were found guilty and, and Jesus came and he set you free. He paid the price for you. He went and served your sentence on the cross. And when you walk out of that courtroom, what's that like for you? In other words, as you enter into this life of freedom, what's it look like? Good. Freedom is this place where we come to this understanding that we realize what it means to walk with Christ. And, and it has come to set us free. We know that this is freedom. We know that this is enthusiasm. We know that this is where God begins to move. But here's the problem. We don't really understand necessarily what freedom is. How do you live in the light of freedom? And what does freedom look like? In this country, we, we love to talk about this, the home of the free and, and, and the, what does freedom really look like? And we might think of things like the, our church is doing in the IJM run, which stands for the International Justice Mission. And we know that churches are to fight for freedom and we're to fight for justice. And, and this is a good cause because what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to help the lawyers all over this world to fight for freedom for people who are enslaved in slavery. So they're going and they're advocating for people who are in sex slave trafficking industries and, and, and when injustice is being done. And there's something in our heart that knows that people deserve freedom. And this is the just cause. And Micah tells us that we should seek justice and we should seek for freedom and the right of people to be set free. But do we understand what freedom really is? What is freedom? 
when you walk out of that courtroom, when you, when you walk into the freedom of life, when you walk into this idea of what it means to come free, there's really a, a couple of different ways you could respond. One would sit there and we could go, I'm going to walk in freedom. And one of us would sit there and go, great, this is awesome and this is amazing. And, and we, as we walk out into this world, as we go out, and what, one of the temptations what we could do is as we go out into this world to live a life of freedom is we could sit there and go, great, I'm free. And then we fall back into the same temptations and the same trials. Uh, so what we do is as we do this freedom and we understand what it means to be free, we could walk out into this world. We could walk out into this idea of freedom. And as we're going out into freedom, what we can do is we can fall into the same temptations and the same trials and the same struggles. Another group of people, when they go out into freedom, what they do is they go, oh, great, Christ has paid for our freedom, right? I'm free. And so what he did on the cross, we sit there and you go, he's did on the cross. So we sit there and you go, okay, I can do whatever I want to do because Christ has paid the way. Is that freedom? And no, it's not. Because in fact, what it is, is anti-nominism. It's, it's people who live against the name of Jesus. Anti-against nominism is following Christ. So against the name of Jesus, people claim the freedom of Christ that gives us the right to do whatever we want to do and to live however we want to live. But that's not what we're supposed to do. Look with me in Romans chapter eight, verse five. It says this, for those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You see, you walk out of the courtroom and you have been set free. And if you don't walk out a changed person, if you don't walk out a, a changed woman or a changed man, if, if you don't allow God's freedom and God's Spirit to come into your life, but you keep going back to the impulses of your natural desires, of your flesh, what ends up happening is you will fall and fail again. Why? Because what we're really oftentimes associating with this idea of freedom is not what the Bible describes as freedom, but autonomy. What is autonomy? Autonomy is why we look forward to retirement so much, right? Autonomy is this place where we go, I'm in control of my life. And, and when I retire, no one's going to be able to tell me what to do anymore. But you are married, some of you, right? elbow. And this idea of, of autonomy, it's this, if I could only be my own boss, no one could tell me what to do. Well, there is this thing called the IRS and government regulations. And we, we seek to strive for this understanding of what it, it means to be autonomous. But here's the problem. Autonomy isn't biblical from the perspective of what we should be striving for. Why? Because autonomy, you were made to be in a relationship and autonomy says, I'm looking out for me. And if you're looking out for me, the ultimate thing, what you're doing is you're trying to place yourself above other people. You're gonna to have to take, you're gonna to have to borrow, you're gonna to have to demean other people in order to get your life the way you want it. Why? Because other people aren't geared to make your life great. And so what God asks us to do is maybe not to live a life of autonomy. And maybe we shouldn't associate this idea of I get what I want as the ideal understanding of what freedom is. In fact, maybe it's something else. What do I mean? Okay, the other night I, went, I had the privilege of going hanging out with the senior adult ministry. It's called Sam here. And um, it was wonderful. And, and I'd love to tell you more about it. Don't go up and ask someone if they're in the senior adult ministry because they might take that the wrong way. Um, but that was... Okay, no joke there. Okay, so um, as, as I went there the other night, we enjoyed hanging out with them and we had um, singing. And then one of the guys got up and he asked this question. He asked us, would you share a time in your life when you were punished as a kid and the lesson you learned? And I thought, oh, which time, right? And I, I sat there and I thought through the stories and I thought through different things. And I remember this one time, this is one of my first recollections. I don't even know if I totally remember it or if my mom just told it to me so many times I kind of remember it kind of thing, you know. But I was really little and I, I was um, going around from light socket to light socket, which we, it, it's not actually a light switch. It's, we, that's what we call electrical outlets in Texas, light sockets, okay? So we were going around and, and my mom didn't want me to touch the electrical outlets. And so I would reach out my hand as a really little kid and try to touch the electrical outlet. And my mom would have to kind of slap my hand. No, no, right? 
And so I, being the Texan independent autonomous person that I was with red hair, decided that I was going to go to the next light switch or the next light socket or electrical outlet, excuse me. And so my mom said she went from outlet to outlet having to swat my hand. And she remembered crying because I was this kid who was already so little and already so independent, didn't want to do what she wanted. You know that kind of moment? And so then I thought about this and I thought, okay, did that, that get that out of me? Well, I remember another time in my life and I don't remember exactly what I did, but I remember my father standing across the room and saying this to me, Daniel, if you do that again, I'm going to spank you. I looked at him and I tilted my head in such that way that your kids sometimes do. And I said, how hard? <laughs> There are moments that are a little more painful to share sometimes. <laughs> but an attempt to be vulnerable, I try. I got to see how hard. <laughs> now, I can look at that moment and I can sit there and I go, what, what's, what's my, why did my father do it? Was he trying to take away my freedom? Why did my dad tell me not to run in front of a car? Why did my dad tell me not to put the cat in the microwave? Why did my dad tell me to do these things, Right? Why couldn't I go over to that area to where the pool was, even though I didn't know how to swim? Why couldn't I do these things? I wanted my freedom. And my dad was just trying to take it away from me. Or maybe my dad was trying to give me laws and regulations to protect me. You see, the flesh, the part of us that sits there and goes, that would be fun. God says, don't listen to your flesh because it's not always fun. Yesterday, I convinced myself that eating six pieces of bacon was okay. Because I came to the men's Bible study in the morning, ate three, and then my wife cooked breakfast again, and so I ate three more. And I thought to myself, that's wonderful. At the end of the night, I was going, oh, oh, I ate six pieces of bacon today. Why? Because it was there. My flesh goes, eat the bacon. And my spirit later said, that was a bad idea. And we do this over and over and over and over again. In the name of freedom, we, we fall into this idea of this is what I want. But Christ didn't come so that you could have what you want. He came to set you free. You realize that the law was given us. The law is not bad. The law was given us to help us to know the best way to live our life. This is where we find freedom. So as we get in verse five, it says, for those who live according to the flesh, they think about the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, they think about the things of the spirit. In other words, you want to walk with the spirit. Look in verse six as we pick up the story. Here's what it says in verse six. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since the spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the same power that raised him from the dead is in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Now, if, if Christ is in you, your mind can't be focusing on what is best for you. To quote Rick Warren's famous book, Purpose Driven Life, it's not about you, but bringing glory to God. And when you bring glory to God and you shift from this idea of what can I get out of life, what, I can, what can I accomplish, then God himself begins to come into your life and dwells with you and the spirit of God walks with you. And when the spirit of God himself walks with you, there is freedom. So how do we do that? Now, look in verse 10. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life. You have to die to yourself and allow the spirit of God to begin to dwell in you. Here's the point of freedom. You wanna walk in freedom? Simply pray this prayer. 
This is the point of the entire message. I'm gonna talk for a few more minutes, but this is the point of the message. This is the goal. This is what I'm trying to get you to do for today and for the rest of your life. If you're struggling in life, you're struggling how to walk in freedom, you feel like your prayers aren't going past the ceiling, you're struggling in life, pray this prayer. Lord, be greater and me to be less. In my life, Lord, be greater and help me to be less. When you do that, well, let me put it to you this way, another way, an illustration I shared a while ago, and we have so many new people, I wanna share it again. The word transform in the New Testament is the word metamorph. And when I think of metamorph and God wants to transform us and make something new, he wants to, us to die to ourselves and become something new, I think of the caterpillar, which goes through metamorphosis. And all the time, some of you are going, I know where you're going. The caterpillar becomes the butterfly. Woo, oh, very good preacher, good, clever illustration. But bear with me for a second, okay? I know some of you are cynical out there. And so this idea, when I was growing up, I used to think that the caterpillar, right? When he was in the, cac when he was in the cocoon, I started to say like a Texan, cocoon. And the cocoon, when, it, when the caterpillar was in the cocoon, that, that little body, he would just like lose his legs and then the wings would sprout out, right? You realize that's not what happens to a caterpillar? That caterpillar goes in, as it goes through life, inching along and, and struggling along like this. And all of a sudden it, it builds up this cocoon around itself. What ends up happening in order for it to become a beautiful butterfly is first and foremost, is it begins to break down all its cells. It breaks down all its cells to, if you cut open a cocoon at just the right moment, you find nothing solid there, but a little bowl of caterpillar soup. It literally, the enzymes literally digest themselves. It dies literally to itself. And what ends up happening is then after that moment, God begins to put those cells back together and it grows and becomes something new. It metamorphosizes, it changes, it dies to itself and becomes something wonderful. Do you want to walk in freedom? You want to become something beautiful or handsome? You want to become something that, that is out of the ordinary instead of just crawling through life and you have to die to yourself to become something new. But let me caution you. This doesn't happen overnight. You can accept Christ and, and become saved and you can become transformed and, and start the process. But let me be very transparent with you from the beginning. In verse 12 through verse 25, it talks about how all of creation is struggling through this metamorphosis. All of creation is longing for the days when creation itself will be restored, when creation itself, when all of creatures will be able to come back into wholeness of Christ which tells me that it describes it as in labor pains. Now, I've never been through labor, but I know that there's pain there, right? As my wife squeezed my arm really tight. But this moment where you realize that there is a pain that we are going through to accomplish where we need to be. But here's the catch. We will become the equivalent of a butterfly in the next life. So we live for that life. But in the meantime, in the meantime, what we do is we go through life and we go through in this dynamic aspect of becoming something new and dying to ourselves daily, breaking down who we are so that God can do something new and amazing and wonderful in us. Do you want that? If you want to become like that, then what you need to realize is there is a natural joy that comes from obedience of the spirit a natural peace a natural freedom a natural wonderful thing that comes out of an obligation of following christ and letting his spirit so then that's what we do is we pray god would you become more in my life help me to fill me up make me less of me and more of you we let the spirit come in what happens when the Spirit comes in, when we walk by the Spirit? Uh, let's look in verse 26 through 28 of Romans chapter 8. When it says, in the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should. 
But the Spirit himself intercedes with unspoken groanings, and he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. You see, when the Spirit comes into our life and we ask the Spirit to come in and we die to ourselves and we pray that simple prayer, Lord, would you come into my life, become greater and help me to become less. Lord, become more like you, help me to become more like you and help me to be less driven by my flesh and my desires. What happens is the Spirit joins us. How awesome is that? God himself joins you. Not just a little, but he joins you as in he walks beside you. So you've been set free. The defense attorney pays your way and you walk out of the courtroom and you don't have the parole officer with you all the time because who really wants that, right? But you have the person who can give you freedom with you. The one who gives you hope, the one who gives you joy, who's sitting there going, "Uh uh-uh, don't do that. Yeah, do that. Yeah, nope, nope, wrong, wrong, wrong. And yes, yes, yes. And so this, this God himself dwells with you to guide you through this life. He joins with you. But what happens when we struggle with that? What happens when we, even though he's joining with us, we, we, we are struggling. Well, look what, how the Spirit joins with us. He joins us in our weakness. But Daniel, I'm struggling with this. I, I feel like caterpillar soup. Well, you should. You're in a cocoon, right? We're not there yet. You're breaking down. You're, you're not arrived. You have not arrived and you will not arrive on this earth. I don't feel like complete. Well, you're not complete because you're still on this earth, even though God is doing an amazing work in your life and there is joy there and, and we can celebrate that. You're not complete because you weren't made for this earth. You were made for the life after. And so as we join together and God, in our weakness, he comes alongside us and says, I've got this. I can help you overcome that addiction. I can help your flailing marriage. I can help you in your identity crisis, in in your self-image reality, in your worry. I can help you when life around you seems to be falling apart. I am with you. I'm joining you in your weakness. And, And even in those moments when we say, God, I'm just so weak. I don't even know how to ask you to help me. Look what it says there. It says, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us on behalf of us with unspoken groanings. So even though you're weak and you're a little thing of caterpillar soup, God's got his arms around you, protecting you, making you something new. And and even though you may not know what to pray, you sit there and go, God, I don't know what to pray. The Holy Spirit comes alongside you and walks alongside you and intervenes and says, I got your back. I'm telling the Father what you need. I'm going to intervene for you. I don't know how many couples have come across my room and their marriage is struggling. And and I simply say, y'all need to pray together because I think when you pray together, the couple that prays together stays together. And and, and a lot of times they'll sit there and go, we don't know what to pray. And I always look at the guy and I say, just grab her hand and say this prayer. God, I don't know what to pray, amen. That sounds like what? But, But there's something about the pricking of the heart, the humbling of yourself when you start a prayer life, when you start this moment in your, in your relationship that creates an intimacy, a bond, and asking and inviting the Spirit to join with you because here's the good news. You don't have to figure the Spirit of God out. In fact, you can't. In fact, that's what the gospel is all about, that you will never be good enough. But even though you and I will never be good enough, God sent his Son to die on the cross to join with you so that God himself could dwell with you so that in your weakness, when you don't know what to pray, when you don't know how to survive, God himself is still there intervening on your behalf. And that is why I am not ashamed of the gospel. And that is why he is worthy of worship because in my brokenness, in my weakness, in the times of my life, when I feel like caterpillar soup, God looks and says, oh, we'll wait till the end product. Because I take all things and I work them and make them into the good for those who follow Christ Jesus. Say, well, what if I get it wrong? Well, the last way that I want you to see the Spirit works is he works according to the will of God. He doesn't just utter whispers to the Father 
Daniel would like a nice new car or a blueberry pie. Instead, what he does is he sits there and he goes, Daniel needs this, Father. He doesn't even know he needs this. And the Father goes, you're right, because that brings glory to me. Do you realize that, that that next verse in verse 20, it says, God works all things together for the good of those who are in Christ Jesus. You know the phrase that says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? I love that. That should be especially true for Christians. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But here's the best part about being a follower of Christ, okay? Even if it does kill you, it makes you stronger. <laughs> win, win, baby! Because we're in our purpose, we become something that is beautiful and new in those moments as we spread our wings. And then ultimately, when we spread our wings and when we become all that God wants us to be, as we die to ourselves and we become more and more filled with the spirit of Christ in our life, then God begins to transform us. He begins to make us new and we have hope. And there we have freedom. You want to walk with freedom? Die to yourself and let the spirit come in. Christian, really simple application this week. Pray this prayer. Lord, help me to become less and you become greater in my life. Don't have to pray anything else. The Spirit does the rest. Now hear me, there's times where we pray specific prayers and are called to pray specific prayers. I'm not saying that we aren't supposed to do that. But when you don't know what to pray, simply pray that prayer. God, help you to become greater and me to become less in my life. If you're not a, a follower of Christ, maybe you struggled and you've tried to find your way on this world on your own. I got news for you, you weren't made to go through this world on your own. Maybe you've even tried to do this Christian life, trying to figure everything out on your own. I would tell you, you weren't made for this. You weren't made to live your life for you. You were made to glorify God. And when you glorify God, ultimately what you will find there is freedom. So if you've never done that today, I would encourage you to say, I want to find freedom. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, that's why we celebrate Easter, that you believe he's still alive and he's intervening on our behalf, the spirit of God can come into your life and dwell with you because he prayed the price for our lives on the cross. You see, when the father sent his son to die, he didn't just do it so that he might get glory, although he is getting glory, right? He did it so that the world could be overcome. And so when we gather together and we sing his praises and we declare how good he is, we are ultimately glorifying God, which is the end. And so today we celebrate that no matter what you've gone through, no matter where you're going through, he is the savior who can move the mountains. He is the savior who has conquered death because he overcame death. We can overcome whatever is in our life. So let's declare and give him his due because he is alive and worth following. We follow him because there is no condemnation as we walk in the freedom of the one who overcame. So God, move. God, help us to become less and you to become more in our lives. Spirit, this is your time and we are your people. If someone in this room, God, does not know how to follow you. I pray that they would have the courage to ask someone or to take the card out of their connect folder and, and write, I want to follow Jesus and then let us follow up with them. God, I pray that we are a church that points people to the freedom of following you and not making it about ourselves. That it's a natural outpouring of ourselves to celebrate and declare how great you are. And God, as we become less and you become greater, may the community and the world around us see how good you are. So today, because you've overcome, may we walk in the freedom of your son and the price he paid. In the name of Jesus, amen.